Blessing your goodness, my God. I thank you, my God, that you're in the heavenly place this morning, my God, that we can come to you, my God, in prayer and supplication. We pray this morning, my God, for the sisters, my God, the ones you use, my God, to care of our children, the creation Sunday school this morning. They give up their meeting this morning, my God, so that we can have theirs. And I thank you for them, my God. Please speak to them. Bless them this morning, my God, and use them. Give them the words this morning, my God. I pray this morning, my God, that you'll use me, my God, a sinner saved by grace. Help me this morning, my God, as I speak to your people, my God. Let there be nothing of me here. Please, my God, let me disappear this morning so that you can appear, my God. Please speak to your people this morning through this sinner, my God. Bless them. And please, my God, as they leave this assembly this morning, let them take in their heart your word, my God. And let them put it into action this morning, my God, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. You know I'm going to break it, don't you? It's already broken. But I'm going to make it worse. It's good to be here this morning. Amen. Of all the places we could be, thank Jesus we're in the house of the Lord this morning. This morning, with the help of God, I would like to speak about a subject. What do you want, Molly? Mother's handbag. Mother's handbag. Sorry, church. Yes, I have a very real family with very real problems. This morning I would like to talk about a very real subject. Something that I believe, and I help my God to speak about this morning. And I think it's kryptonite to the Christian. All the super superhero dogs will know what kryptonite is. It's Superman's problem. Christians have a problem this morning. They have a, a, a kryptonite, I believe. And that is fear. Fear is our biggest problem and our biggest enemy. Fear, anxiety, and worry. You know, something that we don't really understand about fear, I think, is when fear comes in, our mind becomes clouded. You know, for those who have experienced worry and fear, anxiety this morning, you'll know exactly what I'm speaking about. Because when your mind's encompassed with fear or worry or anxiety, you can't see anything else. The only thing you can see is that fear and that problem. And you know, in a perfect world, it's at that time that we would go to the Lord as Christians. It's at that time that we should draw near to Christ. Because he's the only one that can help us. But it's the human condition, unfortunately, that in times of fear and in times of worry, we try to do everything in our own strength. We try to do it in our own power. We think, I can get myself through this. I'll do it. And unfortunately, what happens is we become exhausted and depleted. And we should go to the Lord. But when we need him the most, somehow we seek him the least. You know, when I'm worried, I'm afraid, I've got anxiety, I can only see the problem, I find it very difficult to read my Bible. Is that you this morning? Amen. You know, I find it very difficult to pray. I find it very difficult to spend time with God because I can only concentrate on what is going on. And there's something that happens when that kind of fear and worry and anxiety comes. The enemy comes in. And the little things, he magnifies them into big things. And the big things, he magnifies them even bigger. And we become confused in our mind. The mind becomes cloudy. And you can't see a way out. I want to look at a piece of scripture this morning that I think is a very good example of this and what can happen to a Christian. The piece of scripture that I want to look at is one of the best known, I think, pieces of scripture in all the Bible. It speaks about Jesus walking on the water. Now, most people, Christian or non-Christian, if you mention walking on the water, they'll say, oh, I, Jesus 
supposed to walk in the water, even if they don't believe it. My point is, most people know very well this piece of scripture. And the very obvious thing is, to anyone that looks at it, it's about a lack of faith. We know that. It's, it's, it shows us through that scripture what happens when you have a lack of faith. But when I looked at it, there was something that I found very interesting. If you're a Christian, a born-again believer, and you're down in faith, let me put it that way, for lack of a better word, there must be a reason for that. You know, we know that the Scripture's about a lack of faith, but why? Why are we not trusting in the Lord? Why are we looking at the problem and not Christ? I think the Scripture speaks about fear. I think if we look at it, we can see very clearly it's talking about what happens to us in times of worry and fear and anxiety. Go with me please in your Bible to the Gospel of St. Matthew. And we're going to read this morning from Matthew 14 and verse 24. And we'll read down to about 31 just as the Lord gave us this morning. Just an amen when you're there. Is there anyone needs a Bible this morning? Put your hand up if you need a Bible. Can someone bring a brother Isaac a Bible to us? Is there anyone else needs a Bible? Thank God. And so we're in the book of Matthew 14 and verse 24. And the Bible says this. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is it a ghost? And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if you command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And be beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when he had gotten in the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. Thank the Lord for the public reading of the scripture this morning. Now, just to give you a little bit of background on what's happening here, this, this event recorded in the scripture comes a little while after Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus with a few loaves, a couple of loaves and a few fish, the Bible records, fed 5,000. It was a miracle, of course. After he had done this, the Bible records that Jesus drew to a, a private place to pray. And he said to his disciples, cross the lake, cross the water, and I'll meet you on the other side. And you know, just before we get into God's word into the scripture this morning, an interesting thing for me is this. You know, Jesus went about healing, delivering, eh, doing miracles, doing all these things. But it always we see in Scripture, Jesus took time to pray. You know, he sent the disciples away so he could be alone with God. He was never too busy doing what he had to do to pray. And for me and you this morning, brothers and sisters, there's a lesson in that. You know, we can run up and down doing the things of God. I'm going to church. I'm I'm serving, I'm on the witnessing team, I make the tea, I do the Sunday school, I do all these things. I'm just too busy. Never get too busy to pray. Never get too busy to serve time, to spend time with God. Because the things that you do, remember, can become idolatry. You can get addicted to serving and forget to spend time with God. Jesus reminds us here. Even in all his busy schedule and everything he had to do, he spent time with God. You know what I'm going to tell you this morning? 
Brothers and sisters, I know you know this. I'm not trying to educate you this morning. You're Christians. We need to pray and spend time with God. Amen. Jesus did it. Trust me, we need to do it. But anyway, in verse 24, the Bible says, there was, the boat was on the water. I'll read it again. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. The word contrary is from the Greek word, and it means, if I can pronounce it, enantios, which means to be opposite or opposed or against. And so what the Bible says is, you've got this boat in the water that the wind is pushing against. The Bible says the boat's in the middle of the water. In John's account, it says they rode for three or four miles. This piece of scripture is in three accounts in the Bible. Mark gives an account, John gives an account, and Matthew gives an account. In John's account, it says they rode three or four miles. Now, when I was looking at this, I looked at the boat. The Bible says that Jesus told his disciples, cross the lake. We take it for granted that it was all twelve, because he said to his disciples, go on the boat and cross the lake. Now, we're looking at a boat that would take twelve people at least. I don't know how big that would be, but we know it's bigger than a little rowing boat. It's not one of them. It's most likely one of their fishing boats. A fair size of a boat. The Bible says that they rowed the boat, so we know the boat was an oar boat. It was a boat that was rowed. And they rowed for three or four miles against a storm, contrary to the waves. All of a sudden, the Bible says, this storm got up, and in the Sea of Galilee, that wasn't uncommon. Just out of the blue, a storm would just come up. And so, when I was putting this message together, I pictured these 12 men and this boat. This storm just suddenly appeared, and the big waves, you can imagine, everything that was going on, and them rowing frantically for three or four miles. Now, I come from Montrose to here, as you know, most of you know, that's where I live. But from here, I would say, I might be wrong, somebody from Perth could probably tell me I'm wrong, but I would say it's about maybe four or five miles to Lunkerty, but I'd be right in saying that. Roughly around about there. Now that doesn't seem a lot when you jump in one of the motors and drive to Lunkerty, but imagine what it would be in the middle of a storm in a big heavy boat made of cedar wood that you're rowing. How tired would you be by the time you got four or five miles? These men were completely exhausted. They were completely depleted. They had tried everything in their own strength to get across this lake. They'd put all their own effort and all their own power and to get into the other side. But the Bible says the boat was in the middle of the lake. That the wind had came up. That the waves was tossing this boat around. So what we see here as men that has came to the end of all they can do. They've tried to row, they've tried to get through the storm, they've tried to do everything that they can do in their, their power, and now they can do no more. And they're just there, in the middle of a storm, and powerless to do any more. I want to ask you a question this morning. How many times have we done that, church? How many times this morning have we tried everything we can in our power and in our strength to get through the storm? How many times have we put all our effort into it? Against the waves, against the wind, against the storm, everything coming against you. And you're, you're there and you're fighting and fighting and fighting until you get to that place where you can do no more. You said, I've done everything I can do. I've tried everything. I've fought through the storm. But I can do no more. It just won't cease. It just won't stop. Have you ever been in that place this morning when you think, 
how much more? How many things can happen? How much more can come? How long do I have to fight? Have you been there this morning? Have you done that? Have you pushed and pushed and pushed in your strength? If you have this morning, then we've made the greatest of mistakes. So look what it says in verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, verse 26 says, seeing it as a ghost, and they cried out in fear. And all the accounts, Jesus comes to them. Here in Matthew, he, he, it says he went to them, and Mark, he came to them, and John's account, he drew near to them. And every account of this narrative, Christ, in their time of trouble, and in their time of need, and when they could do no more, he came to them. Amen? Amen. But what does that tell us this morning? Does that say that, that Jesus was afar off and then they got in trouble and all of a sudden he came? No, that's not what the Bible's saying this morning. It wasn't that he came to them. He was always there. They just couldn't see him. They were so afraid. They were so bereft. Their eyes were so much on the storm and in the trouble that they could not see Jesus. And even when the apparition, even when he appeared, when they could physically with their eyes see him, they didn't believe it was him. They said, it's a ghost. Is it a ghost? Can't be him. They never said that it's Jesus, it's the Lord, thank God we're saved. They said, no, it's a ghost. It's a spirit. It's anything but Jesus. I've got a question for you this morning, Christians. Have you been there? Have you been in the middle of that storm? And you know as a Christian, don't you? You know in your heart that you serve God. You know that Jesus is real. But you're so afraid, you just can't see him. Have you ever been there? The trouble is so much, the problems are so big, that you just can't see him. And even though you know he's there, even though in your heart as a Christian, you know I serve a real, true, living God, <coughs> you just can't see him. And I've done this many times, maybe you never have, but I have. You know, Jesus has came to me. I know he's there, I can feel him. But I say, no, it's not him. He can't get me through this one. This is just too much. He's got me through a lot. But he can't get me through this storm. Have you done that? Maybe it's just me. But God forgive me, I've done it this morning. Amen. I've looked, brothers and sisters, I've saw him. I know he's there. But no, he can't do this. It's just too much for him. The Bible says Jesus can do anything. The Bible says there's nothing that Jesus can't give us through. All things are possible in Christ, the Bible says. Brothers and sisters, this morning, whatever you're going through in this place, and I don't know your troubles, trust me in one thing, he's there. But with fear, you can't see him. And maybe fear has stopped you from believing that he's going to get you through it. But trust me in one thing this morning, he is going to get you through it. He's going to get you through this morning. He's not a far off. He's not away in the clouds somewhere. He is with you this morning. The Bible says he'll never leave you. And he will never forsake you this morning. Jesus doesn't just walk away and come back when we're in trouble. Oh, I better go back, they're in trouble. And the good times, the bad times, all the time, he is always there. On the mountains and the valleys, he's the God of all times. He never leaves us. And he never forsakes us. But you know what it takes sometimes? It takes a storm for us to look at him. 
It takes a storm for us to say, I need you. Because when we're on the mountains, and I'm speaking of me this morning, I'm okay. Sometimes it takes a storm. The Bible says in, in verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. I desire, do not be afraid. You know, the Bible shows us here that the disciples were very confused. They were afraid. It records in, I think it's in Mark's Gospel, that their hearts had been hardened. Because they never understood the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. And that tells us something about the state the disciples were in at this point. You know, they were already confused about what Jesus did with the loaves and the fishes. They were already uncertain. And something you'll see when he did that miracle, they never worshipped him, did they? He fed the 5,000 with a few fishes and loaves, but they never went and worshipped him and said, Oh, you are God. They were confused. The Bible records that their hearts was hardened because they never understood what Jesus had done. And here they're terrified. They're trying to go on their own strength. The last thing they're looking for is Jesus. They've tried everything in their own power. They've seen him and said he was a ghost. But look what he does. He comes to them and he says, don't be afraid. It's me. You know, this morning, no matter how many times we stumble this morning, no matter how many times we fall this morning, no matter how many times we get it wrong and we will, when Jesus comes, it's with comfort and words. It's not with condemnation. Oh, you've never believed, you've thought it was a ghost. What kind of people are? You know, he came and he said, don't be afraid. It is me. He came with comfort. And you know when we call on the name of the Lord this morning, it's never condemnation, brothers and sisters. It's always I'm here. I love you. I've got you this morning. Don't be afraid to call on the I've went too far. I've did too much. I've went too far that way. Doesn't matter what you've done. If you'll call out to Christ this morning, regardless of what you're going through, when he comes... It will be with words of comfort this morning. It's me. I'm here. I've got you. Verse 28 records that Jesus spoke to them. He said, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down off the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30 says, But when he saw the one was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And so he cried out to the Lord, Save me. It seems like Jesus spoke to them all. But as it reads, it looks like only Peter listened, or only Peter heard. And Peter says to him, If you command me, to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come to me, Peter. And Peter walked on water. You know, it seems to me that Peter was on a high, wasn't he? For some reason, Peter heard the voice of the Lord. And his faith just went like that. All of a sudden, he just heard God's voice and his faith just went whoosh. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say what happened to the other eleven. But Peter said, if you say it, Lord, I'll come to you on the water. You say it, and it will be right. And Peter stepped out of the boat, the Bible says, and on a spiritual eye, he walked on water. Can you imagine him there? This rough fisherman from the Sea of Galilee. Just a normal man. No special talent, no special person, just a fisherman walking on water. Can you imagine that? The Bible doesn't say that, that God calmed the sea and that Peter was walking on water like glass. Waves 
wind, a massive storm, and there's Peter walking on water. I want to ask you something this morning. Have you ever spent that time with Christ when you've really, really looked at God? You know, when all the rubbish and everything else, you put it to one side and all the politics and everything else, and you've really looked at Christ and you've prayed and you've spent time with God and you've read your Bible and you feel like you could do anything. Amen. Have you ever been there this morning? When you're on a spiritual high and you think, there's nothing I can't do on the power of Christ. Have you ever walked on water? Have you ever walked on water when you said, whatever he commands me to do, I'll do it. I can do it in the power of Christ. Have you been there this morning? Have you been fortunate and blessed enough to have that high that Peter had when you felt that you can do anything in Christ? Well, I've been there this morning, thank the Lord. God has allowed me to be where I think if I keep my eyes on you, I can do anything. But Peter made a classic mistake, one that I've met oh so many times. He took his eyes off Jesus and he put them back in the storm, the Bible says, and he began to sink. You see, Peter said the wind was boisterous, it was a big storm, it was a frightening storm. But while his eyes was on Christ, he could do anything. While he looked at Jesus, he could walk through fire. He walked on water. He took his eyes off Jesus. And he began to sink. It's interesting to me that Peter began to sink. And I'll tell you why. Peter was a fisherman from the Sea of Galilee. I certainly think that he could swim, do you? The Bible records that when Jesus was on the shore, he jumped out of the boat and he, he swam towards the Lord. Peter could swim. So why did he sink? Have you ever thought about that this morning? Why did a fisherman that probably went under the water many times and freed his nets and... Why did he sink? He took his eyes off Jesus, the Bible says, and he began to sink. I'm 52 years old. In my time in the world, I have faced many problems, as I'm sure you have this morning. I faced illness, I faced death. As young Bob Watton said in a song, I have those worries that just won't go away. They just won't go away. And I'm sure you have this morning. So you've dealt with problems, that's my point this morning. You can swim, can't you? You know how to deal with the death and the destruction and the lies and the scum of this world that you have to wade through every day. You know how to do that. Because you've done it long enough, haven't you? But just like the start when they were rowing the boat, see when you do it enough, you get to a point where you can do no more. Peter could swim, but he couldn't fight anymore. He just couldn't do it. He'd, he'd lost all hope. And the Bible says he went from walking in the water to a very low place. He went from where he could do anything with his eyes on Christ to where he couldn't even do something that was so natural to him. He couldn't keep himself afloat. And he began to sink, the Bible says. You know, this morning, for us as Christians, I know you've dealt with problems this morning. I know you've had hard times. I know that you've done a lot. But you know, when you take your eyes off Christ, you will begin to sink. You'll sink into depression and despair. You'll sink into fear and worry. You'll sink into doubt and all these things. You know, that water was on top of Peter and the Bible says he was just sinking. And I 100% believe that he would have drowned if not for Christ. And you know, this morning, if not for Jesus, we will drown. And all the worries and all the problems and all the cares of this world, without Christ, we will drown. But Peter did a wonderful thing, didn't he? The Bible says that Peter <coughs> cried out to Jesus. And Jesus put his hand down and pulled him out. Amen. You know, if you'll cry out to Jesus this morning, he's not away. You know, when, when we look at this narrative, we think they looked out of the boat and he was away over there in the sea. 
That's not what the Bible records, because later on you'll see, the minute they allowed him, he came out in the boat. It doesn't say he ran over and caught Peter. It says he put his hand down and caught Peter. you know why? Because he was right there with him. And when Peter cried out, Lord Jesus, save me, the Lord stretched his hand out, caught him, and pulled him up out of the water. You know, if you cry out to Christ this morning, if you say, Lord, save me, he will pull you out of the water. You know what they never asked? And all the narrative and the three recordings of this narrative in the Bible, they never asked once for Christ to calm the storm. They never asked once, Jesus, will you do something with the weather? Because that's going to kill us. They never asked that. Peter cried out, Lord, help me. You know, this morning you can pray for now until the day you go home to be with the Lord. Take away all my cares and worries, Lord. Take away the problems. We're never going to get rid of the problems. There'll always be problems. One will go, another one will come. Don't pray to get rid of the problem. Pray for Christ to be in the middle of the problem. Pray for Christ to be there with you when you're going through the problems. Praying for them to go away won't get it done. Because another one will come along. And another one will come along. In this life you will have problems. But take heart, he says. I have overcame this one. Don't pray to calm the storm. Pray for the one who commands the storm. Lord, save me. Do what Peter did. Lord, help me. And I promise you this. He will help me. I just want you to go to one scripture and then I'm going to finish. Go to the Gospel of St. John, please. Chapter, chapter 6 and verse 52. It's very interesting what it says. Sorry, I beg your pardon. John 6, verse 21. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. The Bible records that they willingly, by their free will, invited Christ into the problem, into the boat. And immediately, the Bible says, the boat was in dry land. Amen. You see, they never asked Jesus to calm the storm. They asked Jesus to come in, please help me. By their free will, the Lord come into the boat. The minute they did, the Bible says, by a miraculous act, the boat was in dry land. The storm had gone. Everything was right. You know, this morning, if you'll only pray, and say, my Lord, my Jesus, come in my boat. By your free will, Lord, you the captain this morning. You take charge, you take the, the road. You do it. He will get you through the storm. Amen. He will calm the waves. Amen. See, we never ask, calm the storm. No, ask him to be in the middle of your life. Let Christ be the centre of everything this morning. Even when you're going through the worst of the worst, trust in him. And he'll calm the storm. Please, this morning, put your trust in him. Don't ask this morning, oh Lord, do this, do that, do the other. Can you make that one well? Can you take away this problem? No. Lord, can you help me this morning? Please just help me. Willingly invite him in this morning. And he'll take care of the storm, trust me. The Bible says the boat was on dry land. You want through the storm, you want the boat on dry land, you want to get to the end of it, put your faith and trust in Christ. Because remember when he's taken us this morning, the Bible says to a place where the streets are solid gold. He's taken us this morning to a place where you'll never grow old. Where there's no more fear or doubt or pain. There's no more problems. Let him be the captain of your boat this morning. Invite him in. Please, this morning, don't let fear encompass your mind. When you see him, recognize it's him. Say, Lord Jesus, help me this morning. He's always there, brothers and sisters. And he'll always help you. Let's pray this morning.
Blessed Master from what my God. Thank you this morning for your word, my God. I pray, my God, that your word is spoken this morning, because I know, my God, your word is perfect, but I am. Bless your people this morning, help them and strengthen them, I pray. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen.